In this next video on chemoselectivity, we're actually going to cover a really important concept in chemoselectivity and in organic synthesis, and that is the concept of protecting groups. Um, and this is really hits at the heart of uh, organic synthesis and what we're able to achieve because as we look and react uh, certain molecules, and I'm going to just <clears throat> start with something simple such as an amino acid. So we can just take this uh, amino acid um, over here. This is just glycine. Um, and it's got an amine and a carboxylic acid. And if we wanted to start doing reactions on a molecule like this, and we're wanting to do something with them, um, the problem is, is we've got two different functional groups that have reactivities that are not complementary to each other. They're going to start causing problems. Uh, so uh, as an example, if we are wanting to uh, form an ester, um, of this uh, molecule over here. Amines can also react with esters, so we have to be careful about how do we stop that from, uh, from occurring. Um, also, what if we are wanting to couple an amine, some amine to this uh, carboxylic acid over here from another molecule? The problem is the molecule itself already has an amine in it, so uh, we're actually likely to cause some sort of polymerization to occur. So entering the realm of protecting groups, we um, are faced with challenges like this all the time in organic chemistry, and so we need methods and, and ways of being able to do that. Now, the one that you've already covered is a protecting group for the carbonyl group. Um, <clears throat> so I draw acetone over here, and this is a classic example. It's really um, it can be used in a lot of different examples, but uh, um, but here we have a ketone and an ester. Um, and in terms of reactivity, we know that ketones are more reactive than esters. Now, say we want to react at the ester. We want, for instance, to use a Grignard reagent. It's the classic example we use this using this. Um, if we want to react here with a Grignard reagent, we want to do something here. The problem is this is going to react first. And so the solution is to protect this and make it not reactive. And um, the one that you should all be familiar with, um, because we did this last year, is to form a ketal. So it's an acid-catalyzed uh, ketal formation, and we get this uh, cyclic uh, acetal or ketal. And the, the important thing here is, so this is just one example. This is a cyclic version. It's nice because these tend to be a lot more stable. You could have made the methyl one, but that would have been you know, not as stable. So the cyclic um, acetals and ketals are are nice and stable, and so we can just focus on that. The nice thing with these is that we can easily deprotect these just by um, doing the reverse reaction, so actually just adding water um, and acidic conditions, and these can deprotect very easily. Um, and that's one of the most important things about protecting groups. Um, they need to be something that we can introduce easily, and we must be able to remove it easily as well. Um, at the same time, the protecting group must have a level of non-functionality. So an acetal is actually really stable until you put acid present, you have acid present. Um, and so that um, type of reactivity is quite important to uh, to have. Okay, so that's for the ketone, but let's just go and look at all the different functional groups that we, we have. I'm going to start off by looking at, at an alcohol and how we can pre protect an alcohol. There are two ways that we're going to look at with alcohols. The first way is with the silyl protecting uh, group, so uh, silicon. Now, there are a lot of different silyl protecting groups, and we're only going to look at one of them. It's the most common one that gets used a lot. Um, we're not going to use trimethyl um, silane because that is actually very unstable. Um, it doesn't uh, survive um, a lot of uh, conditions, so we don't use TMS as a protecting group. But what we do use is the tertiary butyl dimethyl um, silyl, and, and the reagent we use is just the chloride um, of that um, over there. So it's two methyl groups on a silicon and a tertiary butyl group and then the chlorine. And we normally introduce this with some form of base. Um, it, it turns out that the base base to use is uh, imidazole, uh, which is this. <coughs> All right. So uh, imidazole, just turns out to be one of the most efficient ways of introducing a TB, uh, TBDMS group in tertiary butyl dimethyl silyl. Uh, and um, the mechanism is this is not a strong enough base to remove this proton, all right, the PKA of it's an amine base neutral, it's not strong enough. 
um, this is going to go to the silicon, kick out the chlorine, and then this base will then pick up the, the chlorine over there. There's a slightly different version to this mechanism, but, but that's okay to just um, have that um, as is. Um, and then we introduce the uh, TBS group over there. Now, <clears throat> this has a couple of short shortenings. TBS is uh, a very common shortening that you see, but sometimes it's written out as um, a, a lot of times as well, uh, uh, TBDMS, because it's tertiary butyl dimethyl silyl. So this is the more formal, long version of it, um, but TBS is, uh, you see a lot of as well, so it's important just to recognize that, that these two things mean exactly the same thing. Um, so the silicon groups, what's nice about the silyl groups is when you, you they're very, very easy to put on. Um, and to take them off, they are relatively stable uh, to uh, to base because of the steric hindrance. <clears throat> um, they are acid labile, similar to the, to these uh, the, the acetals over there. They're acid labile, so we can remove them um, with acid. Um, but more typically, the way to remove it is with some kind of fluoride ion, F minus. Silicon and fluorine love each other. Uh, and so an F minus ion is able to add to the silicon that's here and cleave the uh, oxygen silicon bond. Um, and the form of F minus that we often use is in the molecule called TBAF. Um, all right, which is just a fluoride anion, we call it TBAF, it's uh, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. So it's an ammonium. It's got four butyl groups on it, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. <coughs> and it's the F minus uh, counter ion. So, so this is uh, the very common uh, reagent used to deprotect uh, silicon protecting groups, uh, particularly something like a TBS, uh, TBS group. This area of silicon protecting groups is huge. Um, we could spend a lot of time just looking at all these different ones, but this is the one of the most common ones that gets used. Um, and so uh, I think that's fair enough for us to just look at that um, like that. The next one I want to look at is one we've kind of introduced already. It's a benzyl group. Um, so we use something like benzyl bromide and we need some kind of base to, uh, to introduce these two together. Um, I might choose, depending on what else is in the molecule, but I might choose something like sodium hydride. Uh, deprotonate this, you get the O minus, that can re react with the benzyl uh, bromide. And so the protecting group, what we're making as a functional group is uh, a benzyl ether. All right, so here we've got a silyl ether that's being, being formed over there, and this is making a benzyl um, ether. And the benzyl ether is really nice because an ether functional group is incredibly stable. Um, and its stability is something which we um, uh, can exploit because we can do a whole lot of different reactions and it's not going to, uh, to break apart. Um, if we want to remove the benzyl group, we want to go back in the other way. <clears throat> we already explained how to do this in the, the, the talk on reductions. We use palladium on carbon and hydrogen. As, so it's a catalytic hydrogenation of this double bond and we go back this way. So it's actually a really nice re, um, uh, protecting group to use from the point of view of just its simplicity and to, 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 to take it off. Of course, we've got to remember that this does other things as well. So we've got to look at our molecule holistically. We can't have double bonds that can be also reduced, present, if uh, we've got a benzyl group. Otherwise, it's going to reduce them at the same time as well. So we have to be careful about that. Okay, so then I want to now have a look at just the amine uh, functional group, which of course can be a primary or secondary, this is primary amine, um, and there are two protecting groups that we're going to, to look at, and, and both of them are based on um, forming uh, known as carbamate uh, protecting groups, so it's carbamate, uh, and that functional group is that we change this to the nitrogen with a double bond, O, carbonyl, O, and then something else over here, some R group over there, so hydrogen on that. So this fun this over here is your carbamate, um, and it's a really stable functional group, just like an amide, it's really stable. Um, and we're going to look at the two different uh, uh, R groups that are, so these are very, very common protecting groups for, uh, for an amine. So the one I want to look at is known as CBZ, 
Um, and this is uh, carboxybenzoyl. So carboxybenzoyl. Okay, so carboxybenzoyl, the R over there is just a benzyl group. So it looks like this. O and the phenyl ring over there. So <clears throat> immediately from what we've already looked at with the ethers, uh, is that the deprotection of this, what's really nice is we can deprotect using hydrogenation conditions again as well. So just like a benzyl group, um, what happens is when we hydrogenated, this cleaves this bond over here. Um, so we get toluene and this carbamate part over there, that's just CO2, which just eliminates and um, uh, it uh, leaves us with the amine. So this is a great, nice, mild way of removing a CBZ group. How do we put the CBZ group on? Um, the reagent that we use that we buy is benzoyl uh, chloroformate. So <clears throat> let me just write B in there for the, ben the benzoyl. Okay, so this reagent we can buy very easily and then we use some mild base uh, with it as well. So uh, you can use triethylamine, you can use um, you know, any, any mild base. If you wanted to, you could deprotonate, but it's not necessary because the amine is really nucleophilic. Um, so this is going to react with this really, really readily. So we just need a mild base uh, to add to that. <coughs> The second group that we're going to look at, which is really important, so these two, possibly this one is um, you'll see more frequently, is the Bok group. Uh, and Bok is just tertiary butyl um, oxycarbonate. So this is, um, instead of the benzyl group, we've got a tertiary butyl group over there. So it's a nitrogen and O and T butyl over there. Okay, so that's the Bok group over there. Um, the Bok group, if we want to remove the Bok group, um, we just need uh, acid, um, and it's relatively mild um, acid uh, that we would use um, uh, for this. So uh, three molar is normally okay, um, and three molar HCl, for instance, would uh, remove remove this. Um, but there are other acids that people use as well, like, for instance, trifluoroacetic acid, and there's a whole bunch of um, uh, different versions. but but uh, benz, um, tertiary butyl groups are very susceptible to acid uh, hydrolysis. So what's happening there is, you can go and look in your textbook, but uh, practice it. Um, we're going to protonate over there. The lone pair of electrons can kick in, and this bond can cleave, which gives us the tertiary butyl carbocation, um, which is, of course, uh, relatively stable. When I say relatively stable, it itself can then collapse to butene, um, or it could be intercepted by water or something like that. So there's two uh, pathways. But the minute that this bond cleaves under the acidic conditions, we again got the CO2, which can just break away, and we're left with our amine as well. So <clears throat> we've got complementary groups here. Uh, last thing to mention, how do we put uh, Bok on? Um, we use uh, Bok and hydride, which is Bok 2O. And if you know what Bok is, it's actually it's quite a wasteful reagent uh, to use because it's actually two Bok groups and of course only one of them goes goes on. So we have two Bok groups, so it's O tertiary butyl and O tertiary butyl, like that. So that's Bok and hydride. It is, however, a really facile, easy reaction to do, reacts with an amine because that's a fantastic nucleophile and it's very easy to put the Bok uh, group on. Um, and that just leaves me with the last uh, functional group that we just need to look at, and that's a carboxylic acid. <coughs> we can protect these as well. And um, I'm only mentioning because it's actually quite easy to, to do this one because it it's, has the same principle as this over here, um, is that we can functionalize it to make it into the T-butyl ester. So we put the T-butyl group on uh, like that. So we've got some R group. R group over there. Um, so we can make a T-butyl ester, and um, uh, one way to do it is with uh, butene uh, and uh, acid uh, to catalyze it. And we can make a T-butyl ester like that. There are other ways of doing it as well. We could also make this as an acid chloride. Um, so make it into the acid chloride, and, and then react it with tertiary butanol. Um, OH like like that. It, 
it's a slower reaction because this is quite sterically hindered, um, but we can also get it to, to form the T-butyl ester. Uh, the reason that this is a good protecting group for carboxylic acid is because it's so bulky, this T-butyl, it actually makes us quite resistant to nucleophilic attack. So even a Grignard reagent um, adding to this is going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, not impossible, but it is going to make it a little bit more difficult. So um, if we control the conditions carefully, we can definitely get um, the Grignard reagent to add to something else, for instance, like a ketone or aldehyde, um, easily in the presence of this uh, um, T-butyl uh, ester over there. All right. So just in an overall conclusion, you can obviously just go back and look at the video. I'm not going to say anything new here, um, but just to, to remind you that um, we've got a protecting group for uh, ketones, and that is our acetals, cyclic acetals. We've got protecting groups for um, alcohols, and that's our um, silyl ethers. So TBS is the uh, important one, and then we've just got a normal ether, which is the typical one, which is a good example, is a benzyl, uh, a benzyl ether over there. Uh, then we've got protecting groups for um, amines, primary and secondary amines, it doesn't matter. Um, and that we've got the CBZ group, sorry, and we've got the BOC, uh, BOC group as well. So those two, both of them are carbamate protecting groups, um, and we've, we've looked at that. And then lastly, we've got the protecting group for carboxylic acid, and an example of that is the T-butyl uh, ester, um, because that just makes it less uh, reactive <clears throat> through sterics. So th this is an example. Um, and I must stress to you that this really is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of protecting groups. Um, a lot of organic chemistry has really been focused on um, developing different methods, different ways of uh, allowing us to react different groups in the presence of other um, other groups. Um, and so as we work through in class, through examples, etc., cetera, um, you'll start to get a bit of a feel for why we need to use one versus the other. I can't expect you to, to learn um, 50 different functional groups. That's not important. Um, but this selection over here is enough for us to be able to do uh, the basics of synthetic chemistry and, um, and, and just have a, a sense of, of how, how we're going to be able to, to, to strategize. Okay, good.